Okay, now moments ago, I said that I would give an example of a debunking argument that is good in the sense that it is narrow, so it doesn't undermine its own ability to launch an argument, and also that it satisfies the good independent reason principle. It gives people a good independent reason to think that their beliefs are false or they're influenced in a way that makes them misguided. So here's an example from a very famous study in behavioral economics. So this was a study in 2004, and what the people running the study did was they sent resumes out to want ads that were looking for employees. And so here's a resume, an example of a resume for an IT project manager, and the person applying is John Smith. And then they sent out identical resumes so I've just copied and pasted here. So if you look at the resume on the left, it is absolutely identical to the resume on the right. The only difference in the study was that they changed the name. So employers were getting identical resumes where the people applying had exactly the same qualifications, exactly the same education, exactly the same work experience. The resumes were identical the only difference were the names. And so some of the names were stereotypically white American names, like John Smith. And then some of the names were stereotypically black American names, like Jamal Jones. And what the researchers found was that people with white names, and of course these aren't real people, these are just made up applicants, made up applicants with white names systematically got more callbacks than made up applicants with black names. So if your name was John Smith, you were 40 to 50% more likely to get a callback, even though you submitted the exact same application. So how is this a debunking argument? Well, this is debunking the idea that we can evaluate the applications of job applicants in a sort of objective, neutral way. Why does it debunk that? Because you have two applications that are objectively identical. The only difference is that one has a stereotypically white name and the other has a stereotypically black American name. And the way people evaluate them are fundamentally different. The people with the white names get 40 to 50% more callbacks from the people with the power to give people jobs and money. So you get the idea. So this is a, a very narrow debunking argument in the sense that Vavovo recommends. So this doesn't suggest that absolutely all of our judgments are flawed. This doesn't suggest that our evaluative capacities are totally broken and we can't rely on them in any way. All it suggests is that when people in positions of power are evaluating applications, the race of the applicant impacts on the decisions that get made. And really, it's even narrower than that. It's saying that job applicants in Chicago, I believe this study was conducted in Chicago, job applicants in Chicago around 2004 in a particular class of work are systematically discriminated against if they have stereotypically black American names. So it's testing a very narrow uh, belief, and also it's satisfying the good independent reason principle. Because the reason that these people are making different decisions about these applications has nothing to do with the evidence or arguments that they would give for the decision. So if they were asked, why did you call this candidate rather than this one? They would say, oh yeah, you know, this, this part of the, the resume really impressed me. This piece of experience, I thought that sounded really good. They wouldn't say that, oh, I called that person because he was white. <laughs> they would say that they had reasons for doing it. So it's really a good independent reason in the sense that it just doesn't connect with the arguments and evidence that they would give for their judgment whatsoever. Unless, you know, some of these employers are explicitly racist, but we're assuming in 2004, that we're not getting explicitly racist judgments. At least, you know, the, the, the authors of the study weren't making that assumption. So you see, this is a good kind of debunking argument because it's, it's narrow, 
it doesn't undermine your evaluative judgments in general. So it doesn't, for example, undermine your ability to reason and your ability to use evidence and to use that evidence towards drawing a conclusion. And it gives you a good independent reason to think that you might be mistaken. You can show people this evidence and say, look, employers evaluated identical CVs or resumes and they came away with radically different decisions on the basis of something that is totally irrelevant to the decision. The applicant's name has no bearing whatsoever on the quality of the applicant, on what skills the applicant might have. So this is why now a lot of companies have a policy where they take names off of resumes when they read them, because this study and studies like it have had a huge impact. Okay, so here's another example of a debunking argument of the sort that Bavova has in mind. So there's a study in the Journal of Neuropsychologia, which shows that there's a link between brain damage and religious fundamentalism that's been established by this scientific study. And so the idea is prefrontal cortex is involved in mental flexibility. And so they studied 119 Vietnam vets who had brain damage in the prefrontal cortex and then they studied 30 who had no brain damage. And the results showed that damage to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and damage to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex associated with religious fundamentalism. So here we have Vavova's two principles satisfied again. So this is narrow. It's not saying that all religious belief has been debunked. It is showing that there's a link between brain damage and a particular kind of religious belief, fundamentalist religious belief, which is this very inflexible, dogmatic, black and white form of religious belief. So it's not debunking all religious belief. And so that's a real strength because, again, it doesn't undermine its own capacity to make its own argument. And it also satisfies the good independent reason principle. Because when you ask these Vietnam vets, why they believe that fundamentalism is true, the arguments that they give and the evidence that they adduce will have nothing whatsoever to do with their brain damage. So this evidence of brain damage is evidence that is completely independent of the evidence and arguments that they would make in favor of their belief in fundamentalism. Okay, so that's all for now. That is my attempt to give you a picture of the entire dialectic of this module, and I hope it helps you when you sit down to write your critical comparison uh, for your final assignment. Thank you very much.